following program is brought to you in living color. Ladies and gentlemen, let's do it. It's time over. Via the nether regions of the World Wide Web, broadcasting from the center of the base of the Palm of Michigan, it's the Mike Holder Show. Great googly moogly. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dudes and dudettes, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. It's Friday night. It's Friday night nights. We normally title it that, this episode, but we didn't tonight. Welcome to another episode of The Mike Holder Show on this November 2nd, 2012. I'm your effervescent and... Pudding free host, Mike Holder. Pudding free because I didn't get any chocolate pudding. I requested earlier. <laughs> oh my goodness. How y'all doing? I'm doing pretty good myself. It's been a nutso day. Just a reminder about how screwed up things are. And how hurting each and every one of us seems to be in this world. Economically, emotionally, physically, politically. It's crazy. It's just crazy. Totally nuts. (sighs) Touch on a few things tonight. Got a lot, so I'm going to breeze through it. The woes continue in New York. Drivers waiting six hours for gas in New York City. Tempers still rising. They're finding bodies left and right. Restaurant hotel prices are skyrocketing. On Craigslist, gas, 15 bucks a gallon? What? You thought price gouging was bad in Michigan, folks. Utility workers pelted with eggs. Staten Island is basically, they have nothing. Plus, now they're talking jet fuel supplies becoming a concern, so they can't fly people in or out. It's just dire. And in New Jersey, I guess they started some uh, 70s style gas rationing. So it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. And nothing seems to help. But let's talk, uh, before we get into all that, let's get into sports. <laughs> sports! First of all, big announcement that just came off the wire about oh hour hour and a half ago and it just came like an hour and a half ago two hours ago actually no it came out at 5 30 this evening so but why they waited so long the new york city marathon was canceled friday evening by mayor michael bloomberg after mounting criticism that this was not the time for a race while the region is recovering, of course, from Hurricane Sandy. And it's true. I mean, why are they doing a race? And the thing is, the the start of the race is on Staten Island, and Staten Island is really hurting bad. It's a mess. The bridges are, like, all messed up, you know? And it's like, you know, why? Why are they doing it? So they chose the right decision to cancel. I mean, they were talking, hotels weren't even going to give rooms to uh, marathon runners while citizens are homeless. They were going to give the rooms to them. Of course, tonight they had the big uh, telethon with Bruce Springsteen and all that. I think the marathon runners should stay and help out this weekend and try to lend a hand. That would be the cool thing to do. The city has given them so much with this marathon that would like be a way for them to give back you know I mean really it would just be the right thing to do and then of course some of the runners are all peeved it's like we got here on Thursday and now they cancel it or we just got here today and they turn around and cancel it it's like well stick around help out step to the plate 
Oh, well. So anyway, New York City Marathon canceled. And thusly so. Not rescheduled either. They're not rescheduling this stupid thing. They have canceled it. It's done for this year. No New York City Marathon this year. And now that we got that out of the way, one more sports-related story, which uh, grinds my cookies, man. Grinds my cookies. It does. Today, the NHL, the National Hockey League, the No Hockey Losers this year, they canceled the Winter Classic. It was a cool game. This year it was going to be held just down the road in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the Big House, which would have given it a record crowd for a hockey game. A record crowd, you know? I mean, uh, over 105,000 people watching a hockey game? Yeah. It was going to be the Red Wings versus the Maple Leafs. But they canceled it. Uh... It was supposed to be played January the 1st, New Year's Day. Latest, most significant cancellation of the nearly seven-week lockout that has wiped out the league schedule already for last month and now this month, November. They said the logistical demands uh, for staging this kind of event made today's decision unavoidable. Simply out of time. They could have done the game. They could have got players to play. Come on. Just because there's a lockout of the regular season, you shouldn't have a lockout of the Winter Classic. Come on, please. I mean, let's look at this, all right? Let's take a look at this. I mean, <laughs> look at the economics. Right now, because this game has been canceled, it not only cancels the Winter Classic in Ann Arbor, but they were going to have outdoor games at Comerica Park called the Hockey Town Winter Festival. That was going to start December 27th, which included the Great Lakes Invitational. They were going to do that outdoors. You know, Michigan, Michigan State, Western Michigan, and Michigan Tech. And then they were going to have an Ontario Hockey League doubleheader, an American Hockey League game between the top farm clubs of the Red Wings and the Maple Leafs. And then they were going to have two games between Wings and Leafs alum. Some of these games, of course, will be moved indoors. The... Uh, July will be moved indoors, Great Lakes Invitational. But, uh, you know, the OHL and AHL games will be reassigned as regular home games for the teams involved. The alumni games canceled until next season, which I think sucks. Uh, the HBO 24-7 reality series will not happen either. Um, it's lost 80, $800 million in revenue as a result of the lockout the NHL is saying. However, the loss of the Winter Classic is even worse. It's going to affect tons, hundreds of millions of dollars of income coming into Detroit and, of course, into Ann Arbor. So thank you, NHL. Not only have you taken away our hockey for the year or for most of the year so far, the good part, but uh, you've taken away the Winter Classic. Oh, my gosh. That's terrible. Anyway, on from sports, let's move to the three-ring circus known as politics and all that's going on there. It's craziness. The big thing, all right, the big thing uh, was Geraldo Rivera taking one of his fellow colleagues to task Eric Bowling a Fox host on Fox and Friends basically took him to the task about his claim of how well the United States responded to the attack on our assets in Benghazi Geraldo had his program on Fox of course he's a Fox correspondent as well and he drove his uh information clip that he did on Fox and Friends split into three segments. Number one, how well the United States prepared for Benghazi. Number two, how well the United States responded to the attack on our assets in Benghazi. And number three, how well the United States explained the attack to the public after it went down. Geraldo pretty much 
gave number one and number three legitimate openings for accountability and criticism, which I think so. But he said number two, no. He said basically the response to the attack by personnel on the ground was strong. He noted that he's spoken to a four-star general, Jack Keane, and a, force vi- a former vice chief of staff of the United States Army, um, and convinced by these two gentlemen that the military did whatever it could have done under the circumstances. The CIA and the State Department don't get high marks from Geraldo on this. I don't think so. All right. Yeah, Eric Bowling did make a lot of grandiose claims that turned out to be false, but let's look at the facts here. All right. First off, when we went and got Osama bin Laden, we had drones in the air, and the Situation Room was watching the whole time, in real time, the whole attack, and doing what they could with that. And it's like, you know. um, So they knew what was going on as it was happening. Now, according to some reports, which have not been proven or denied yet, but according to some reports, they had drones in the air in Benghazi watching this whole thing unfold. Now, if that's true, you can't tell me that this video feed was not being sent to the Situation Room. Now, what I want to know is who was in the Situation Room? If the President had no idea what was going on, then who was in there calling the shots? Certainly wasn't the Commander-in-Chief. This thing gets deeper and deeper. You know, yeah, there has been a lot of grandstanding, and there's been a lot of politicizing of this Benghazi thing, but there have also been very many unanswered questions. Many. All right. Pentagon is sending secret special ops troops to hunt down the attackers there. All right. The CAA, of course, revealed its timeline the other night. We told you about it on the broadcast. No mention of protesters in this timeline. They knew three hours before the attack that armed militia was gathering, according to the CIA timeline. Sensitive U.S. documents still lying around in the wreckage there in Benghazi for anybody to pick up. State Department never called for a military backup. It's just crammed. And it seems the media is reporting this whole Benghazi thing not as reporters, but they're using the administration's terms of what's going on. There is no investigation going on with this, which I think is diligent, is is derelict on the media's part. All right. Now, there was security assistance that did arrive in Tripoli. However, this is the quote, all right, the text. An American quick reaction force sent from Tripoli had arrived at Benghazi Airport at 2 a.m. Now, that's four hours after the attack on the consulate. Then they were delayed 45 minutes at the airport because they could not get first, at first, get transportation, allegedly due to confusion among quote-unquote Libyan militias. Now, that's the part I'm looking at. Who are these Libyan militias? Well, it turns out the militias, the Libyan forces that overthrew Gaddafi. Investigation has turned out. The State Department has found this out. And intelligence has found this out. And other members of the international community found this out that these Libyan militias, these independent freedom fighters, are actually Al-Qaeda. Now... If our forces are going to arrive in Tripoli and they're going to rely on these militias who are actually Al-Qaeda to help them out, come on, please. They're not going to help us out. They'd rather kill us. And, and for us to trust these militias, these uh, freedom fighters who turn out to be Al-Qaeda, we basically did the same thing we did to Osama bin Laden in 1980. We basically said, okay, we'll give you money, we'll give you guns, we'll give you support. And then when we yank it under them, they're going to come and kill us because we're not giving them what they want anymore. When you make strange bedfellows, that's what's going to happen. All right? Let the buyer beware. Anyway, enough of this. we got to get on. We're almost halfway through the program. I haven't done any music yet. But uh, since the election is only three days away, I want to make sure that you all have information on how to vote properly. So here's some instructions. 
on how to vote no on Proposition No. If we asked if you've seen the ads supporting Proposition No, you'd probably say yes, if you're in the know. But how do you know if a yes vote on no will work? Something this complicated can't really be a yes-no question, no? Yes, it isn't. So the answer is no. You could vote yes on no if you're a yes person. But if you're sick of hearing no to better schools and no lower taxes on working families, voting yes means you really don't know. Know this. No no voter knows less than a yes person. You understand yes, yes? So say yes by voting no on Prop No. Because a yes means no. And that's a no-no, you know? You're listening to The Mike Holder Show. Do you mean that rhetorically, or is this just more idle flirtation? I radio Mike Holder on Spreaker.com. for me is it something I can never repay see this believing I try to find a reason I don't want to do to make you want to stay seeing you again gets me thinking again and I can't get you out of my mind cause I'm out on a limb and I'm trying to win can we please just try this one more time thinking maybe Aim for the weekend and over it on the Mike Holder Show, Spreaker.com, where literally thousands and thousands of people have their own internet radio stations, and you too can do your own internet radio show right here on Spreaker.com. One of my friends has an internet radio show here on Spreaker.com. One of my good friends, broadcasting compadre from a few years back. We worked together out there on Kavanaugh. Under the mighty shadow of the Mike FM Tower, which also cast its shadow on Lansing Everett High School, the alma mater of one Irvin Magic Johnson. Doug Warren, 
He's taking the night off, so we kind of took his time slot because we figured, well, we're not going to step on him, so we'll take the 11 o'clock slot. He's sitting on the pine tonight, sitting on the bench, resting. And he'll be back on Monday with a vengeance. You have no idea. Day before election? Oh, he's going to have a lot to say in 30 minutes' time. It's the Doug Warren Show right here on Spreaker.com. Make sure you check it out. Every Monday through Friday, as well except tonight, of course, 11 p.m. Eastern Time. And speaking of Eastern Time and time in general, don't forget tomorrow night. We fall back, set your clocks back an hour tomorrow night before you go to bed. Why? Because time will go back. And plus, you get an hour more of sleep. Why wouldn't you do that, man? Unless you're against sleep. And if you're against sleep, what the hell is wrong with you? (laughs) Okay. Let's look at all this. We're three days away from the election, all right? And everything is just going nuts. The pollsters are all going nuts. ABC, Washington Post, has it pretty much a dead heat. Rasmussen pretty much has it a dead heat. Uh, Anyway, this one interesting poll, 63% want a second term from Obama. However, this poll was not taken in the United States. It was taken in China. Yes, China. China would love to have Obama for a second term. They can get richer off the debt that we owe them and the goods we buy from them and we become poorer then there's the big news okay the unemployment figures got released first of all they were talking about delaying them until after the election which I think should have been done however the unemployment rate went up another point 7.9% 7.9% October unemployment. That's higher than when Obama took office in January of 2009. That means Obama is facing voters with the highest unemployment figure of any incumbent since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Incomes are still continuing to decline. As our debt grows, our incomes shrink. As prices go up, our incomes shrink. It's one of the negative features of our current economic recovery. has been these declining incomes of the average Americans. We're having this economic recovery, but yet Americans are not getting a recovery. They're losing. Labor Department reported Friday that despite 171,000 jobs being added to the non-farm payrolls in October... Average hourly earnings for such employees edged down by one cent to $23.58. That's per hour. That's the average. Average hourly earnings of private sector production and non-supervisory employees also dropped by a penny to $19.79. An hour. Now, you translate one penny per hour into 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. That adds up, man. The average work week for production and non-supervisory employees on private non-farm payrolls also edged down by one-tenth of an hour to 33.6 hours. As such, despite the positive headline numbers in the report, this is by no means a strong jobs market this far into an economic recovery. And that's the thing. We are supposedly in this economic recovery that started in 2009 with the incentives and the bailouts and everything else and the interest rates and these job creation things. But yet, we're still getting negative figures three years into it. This is a slow recovery. I think we need to take some jumper cables to this. We need some drastic measures because it's not working, folks. And the campaign is getting all heated. And the thing is, all the bucks are going into Ohio. Yes, Ohio is the battleground state. Everybody feels that that's the state to win now. Pretty much forgot Michigan and all the rest of the middle Midwest states, but Ohio is the place. More dollars are being thrown into Ohio advertising for political campaigns for Obama and Romney than any other state, and they're nasty. Some of the nastiest ads, if you're in Ohio, you'll see them. And as this month starts to fly in the last days of the campaign, 
interesting man. He's a historian. He's an author. His name is David McCullough. He did an interview with Morley Safer that will be airing Sunday on uh, 60 Minutes. Basically, he's saying, the current name-calling pales in comparison to the days of old. He kind of gave a recollection of how Thomas Jefferson defeated John Adams in 1800. Apparently, Jefferson paid a journalist to write that his opponent was a mentally unbalanced hermaphrodite. <laughs> and then Adams <laughs> Adams went out and spread the word, okay, that his opponent, Jefferson, get this, <laughs> talk about funny, oh my, that a Jefferson victory would mean murder, rape, and robbery in the streets. However, the two candidates never got along. Years before, when Adams was George Washington's vice president, according to McCullough, they went after each other on the floor with fire tongs. Yes, fire tongs. You know, the kind you use in the fireplace. Just imagine how that would look on the nightly news. <laughs> or on C-SPAN. You've got congressmen going after each other with fire dogs. Oh my gosh. Uh, if we look at the current state of our nation through the prism of history, we, sh we sure have it a lot better than they did in the 1800s. That's for sure. We are more advanced, but we have problems just as bad, if not worse, than they did in 1800. In 1800, they didn't have the debt we have today. In 1800, they didn't have the social program bludgeoning and growing and swelling in our government as they did back then. These are all relatively new things that are here in the here and now. I came across an interesting interview with Mitt Romney's dad that was done, I think, back in 1992. George Romney, Mitt's dad, was the governor of Michigan. He was also the chairman of American Motors, which was the outside auto company. Back in the day, there were not just the big three, but there were four. There was, of course, GM, Chrysler, Ford, and then there was American Motors. They had their headquarters up in Southfield. And they had the Rambler, which did very well and gave the big three a run for their money. But then, of course, they had the Pacer. <laughs> and they had the Gremlin. My uncle had a Gremlin. The only cool thing about it was it had like a 55-gallon gas tank on it. <laughs> you remember the Gremlin? Wayne's World. The movies. Remember the Gremlin? And then the Stretch Gremlin? <laughs> <laughs> and the Eagle, that was another one they did. So there you go. But well, I'll have that interview for you on Monday. But right now, it's time to end things because we're running out of time. Lots going on. Lots happening. Too much happening almost, you know. It's been one of those days, you know, it's trying to make it happen. As we do the best. Yeah. You know. The weekend's coming. So enjoy the weekend. Have fun. Maybe we'll have hockey again someday. Maybe we'll have sanity one day. Thoughts and prayers to everybody there in New York. Especially those on Staten Island. They're basically being ignored. Nearly half of the New York City deaths from Superstorm Sandy happened on Staten Island. Basically got inundated. Power out. It's devastated. So our thoughts and prayers go to them. Get a hold of your local Red Cross. Tell them you want to donate to help out New York. They'd be glad for it. Well, it's the weekend, so I'm out of here. Until next time, Mike Holder telling you to always look forward and always keep looking upward. Later, y'all. I'm so excited, I could squirt.